So we will be looking at the text on the triumphal entry. Uh, that comes in all four Gospels. It is an account that is found in all four of the Gospel narratives. Um, if you're taking notes, I'll just give you the verse references. We'll kind of be jumping back and forth between the lot. But Matthew 21, verse 1 and following. Mark 11, verse 1 and following. Luke 19, verse 28 and following. As well as John 12, 12 and following. Um, as we look at um, this, this narrative, what, what's going on here, um, Matthew is probably the one that we will, we will be using the most. Uh, we will be jumping back and forth because each one of them catches uh, different parts of the story. Uh, but please know that I think we'll probably be in Matthew if you want your Bibles open, but it's always helpful to have it in all the places. Um, and then we're going to spend some time in the book of Zechariah, just a few moments in Zechariah. Uh, so but feel free to go ahead and begin looking for those and placing your fingers um, in those places. Um, now we start in Matthew 21, just, just for our cases today, verse 1. Now they're drew near, uh, now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent to his two disciples saying, What? You don't have to read it verbatim, but you can. Fill me in on the details. Go get the donkey. And then what's the, the next line, basically? If anyone has a problem with it, you say the Lord has need of this, and they're going to let you have the donkey. Well, the two disciples run off. They go to find the donkey, and what happens? It was right there, just like he said. Just like he said. There apparently seemed to be two people standing nearby, the owners of the donkey, not just some hired hand, but the owners. And uh, what did the disciples say? The Lord needs it. They let the donkey go, and uh, there's question as to whether there was a single donkey or a donkey and a colt. Um, okay. What's that? It's a donkey and a colt. A donkey and a colt. Um, and so we have here the Jesus or the disciples bringing that back to Jesus. They lay their coats on the colt, and Jesus jumps on board. And what happens next? He rides into Jerusalem. Looking at your text, and like I said, you, I'm just asking you to be in Matthew, but feel free to use any of the accounts. What's picture what's going on and tell me what you see what you hear and you can I mean, you can quote from the bible i don't care just i'm asking you to spend a moment looking well, there's two groups of people that seem to there's the group that's with him primarily probably from galilee there's the crowd that's going to jerusalem so they're excited. They're celebrating the Passover time. There seems to be a group that comes out from Jerusalem to meet them, um, which is kind of important. Um, you have a donkey that's a colt that's never been ridden before. Think about that. Don't jump too far ahead. We'll get there. <laughs> so you're seeing. You're seeing the crowds. That's what you're focusing on. And I like the way Greg pointed that is we've got, you, I like the way you, you itemize these three groups. You've got the Galilean group who, by the way, have just experienced the raising of Lazarus in a fairly small town. Um, so there's going to be some excitement there. I imagine with, and we're going to come to the Passover just here in a second, but you've got a crowd of people who, let's say they haven't even seen the, the raising of Lazarus. They are coming uh, to Jerusalem because of because of Passover, which is a travel. I mean, it's a, it's a great fanfare of a, of a week. And then you've got the crowd that are coming from Jerusalem. So we're imagining that word has traveled that Lazarus was raised from the dead. And this is really the this this the raising of Lazarus 
was the closest miracle that I can remember Jesus doing through Jerusalem. Up until this point, Jesus' work seems to primarily be out further into Galilee. Greg's puzzling now, and, and there may be others that I'm not thinking of, but it seems that most of his work seems to be kind of more on the distance. He's bringing it close, and this is a message that's able to travel into Jerusalem fairly quickly. So now you have a group of people in Jerusalem who are saying, well, we just heard about this miracle, and they're rushing out to see Jesus come in. What else do you see? What else do you hear? I think, I think because of the excitement of the people, uh, they're, they're saying Hosanna to the son of David. So at least a portion of these people are recognizing him uh, for who he is and, and his coming. So we have a group that are, that are yelling uh, Hosanna. That one's not in the Matthew account, is it? Is it? Yeah. Is it? Yeah, there it is. Verse 9. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Can you imagine a mob of people yelling and chanting that? The energy that would drive. Now, on top of that, so, so you're looking at it, Roger, from the moment of saying there's people who see what Jesus is coming to do. Let's think about it for, let's say there's a group of people who don't really get what Jesus is doing yet. It doesn't matter whether they get that Jesus is the Savior or not. That point's irrelevant. We'll come to that in a moment. However, they're coming out because they see Jesus as maybe the one who's going to kick Rome out. They see Jesus as the one who's going to solve their Roman problem and the Roman occupation and is going to free them from that. It's going to reinstate Israel. So you have Jesus riding in on a donkey. Mobs of crowds. What do they have in their hands? Coats and palm branches. Coats and palm branches. Waving palm branches around. We'll come to that in a minute. So I want you to see what's happening here. Imagine, imagine a, um, if, it, if it was winter time, I'd say a Christmas parade. But that's probably, that's a bad, we normally think of winter with snow. Don't think of that. Think of a, think of a parade though. I don't want to jump too far ahead. So let's go back. As we start the beginning again, Pentecost was a feast. It was a traveling feast for Jerusalem that really bases its history from Exodus chapter 12. I'm in Exodus chapter 12. That's where the people are about to flee out of Egypt. And what was kind of the, the terms of, of how they got out of Egypt? No details, just running, running quick overview. Are you, are you talking about the Passover feast? Correct. Yes, I am. The Passover lamb. Uh, they were to uh, eat the meal hastily with their cloak tucked in their belt and their staff in their hand, being ready to go. So after, after they ate this meal, they knew that they were going to be delivered. So it was a quickly eaten, have your family over, celebrate, put the blood on the doorpost. Because and, and because the angel of the Lord was going to pass over the homes that had the blood on the doorpost. And that would then ensure that they could actually leave Egypt. So the Passover itself, what themes or what ideas would it carry for a Jewish person? Remembrance. Remembrance. Nationalism. God's power. So these emotions, these feelings, it kind of, what y'all are kind of saying, kind of makes me think of like a 4th of July day. You know, a, be a parade. There would be this national identity. There would be this idea that we're free. We're, we're no longer under the oppression of Britain. We're, we're our own. And I think it goes even further than just a 4th of July, but I want you to try to put some modern idea to it. The people I find have found freedom from persecution, from oppression, from slavery. 
John tells us in John chapter 12, his account of the triumphal entry, uh, right before six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead, uh, which tells us now his location. He is in Bethany and another town called uh, Bethpage. What I find interesting about these towns is this would have been the route that the sacrificial lamb for the Passover feast would have taken coming from the fields into Jerusalem. And the high priest would have selected that lamb and it would have traveled on this day into Jerusalem in preparation for Passover. How does that idea play into the triumphal entry? If the triumphal entry is four days before the Passover, the lamb is selected on that fourth day and to be watched, cared for by the family until it's sacrificed on the day of Passover. So you had the selection of the Passover lamb, careful, watched, tended to, as it's preparing its journey in for its own execution. The lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So this triumphal entry is more than just re Jesus riding on a donkey. It begins a, a piece of this, or it's part of the piece of the symbolism of Jesus being the Lamb of God who has come to offer deliverance, to offer a, a passing over of the angel of death in our lives. Jesus rides a colt. This is often illustrated as a, um, as a, as a victorious warlord, a king who is riding into a city. Um, and that is so very, that's a very true image because Jesus is riding into a city, except if you were a warlord, the king riding into the city, you probably wouldn't have chosen a donkey. What would you have ridden on? Big fancy white horse. Big fancy white horse. That would have been the prettiest thing ever. And you'd come in, there'd been a big fanfare. Jesus isn't doing that. He's coming in riding on the colt of the donkey. Revelation 19, he rides it like one. Oh, that's a good one. I see what you're saying now. Good. Can everyone hear, Greg? Repeat that. Repeat that, Greg. In Revelation 19, he is riding the white horse. That's what I was just looking up. But doesn't the Bible say the least will be the greatest and the greatest will be the least? So coming from that perspective at this point, he's the bottom of the bottom, the least of the least. So well and and I think what Laura, what you're what you're giving us right into is was Jesus' kingdom going to be a kingdom of dominance? Was it going to be a kingdom that was going to kick Rome out? Not yet. Not yet. But it, it wasn't from that perspective. It wasn't an earthly kingdom. Jesus was coming to bring a spiritual kingdom, a kingdom that would, uh, would, would dominate the lives of people, but not necessarily be one that would cast people out, would, would destroy people. He was bringing a kingdom of peace. And coming in riding on a donkey is a great representation, a great moment where he is showing Jesus is coming to bring more peace to the world, not necessarily a new owner or a new um, overlord. Now, Greg mentioned this a moment ago. He's riding on a colt, and it's it's very explicit. I forget which reference, but it's this is a this is a colt that has never been ridden before. Well, one, I'm going to ask before we get to that question: Have you ever ridden a donkey before? Anyone ever ridden a donkey? I've ridden a donkey just a handful of times in my life. And my experience is that their back is about like that right there. It's like an a frame house. You know, a horse has a fairly rounded back. My experience with a donkey is it's like that. I don't think they're very comfortable to ride. My grandfather rode donkey. He was a, a donkey or a mule guy. Seems like there's always people that way, aren't there? 
but you have him riding on an animal that's never been ridden before. What happens to a horse the first time you try to throw a saddle on it and jump on its back? He doesn't want you on there. It is a tad wild. You ever seen a guy try to break a horse? In the movie. In the movies. Okay, that's close enough. What's it look like? Uh, the horse don't the cotton to that too well. It looks painful. What'd you say, Roger? The horse don't cotton to that too well. <laughs> <laughs> that horse or mule, and the mule is the same as me for mule jumping all over the place. And a mule can jump, or a, a donkey, I'm sure, can jump too, but uh, I should say donkey, mules are different. But we got an animal here. Jesus jumps on his back, so I'm gonna either submit two ideas. One, Jesus is really good at breaking a mule before, a, a donkey before he rides it. Or what would be the second one? Maybe is it possible that this is a sign that even the animals submit to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Vicki just said that she uh, she believes that that donkey was just very peaceful. Look at her. Look at her just pulling out the peace the peace card there. You know, I'm I'm looking and seeing that that this is a sign that Jesus is even ruler of the animals. And as they uh, go, they they have this comment. It's it's the Lord needs the donkey. What do you think about that exchange? What comes to your mind? The possibility, a good probability, actually, I guess, is that the people actually knew him and were prepared for this. We're, we're pretending that they're just giving the donkey over with no foreknowledge. This is a small world. It's not like he's rode into Louisville, Kentucky, and you might not have ever heard of him or seen of him before. He's a pretty popular guy. So to know that maybe they were aware, and maybe when the disciples come and they say the Lord has need of this, maybe they're already attuned to the idea that, oh, we, we know. Well, it's interesting, too, that he uses the Lord because there in the beginning you know he tells his mom and everybody my time has not yet come he slips in and out of places um, doing miracles and things like that and so he never really comes right out and says I am the Lord and the one to come and stuff in, in all of the beginning stuff but then here as he's going to the final road and everything then he, he takes the Lord turn for himself so he's announcing himself I am coming Boy, is he ever announcing himself? I mean, riding into Jerusalem on the donkey, he, he is he is publicly professing now who he is and what his role is. And we're, when we get to Zechariah, we're going to see more of of how that that plays in. He is not bashful at this point, and there's no hiding. They're waving palm branches. In 1st Maccabees chapter 13, uh, this, is, this is where I think it's probably the, the nearest reference or one of the closest references to uh, palm branches. There was a great celebration in the city because this terrible threat to the security of Israel has come to an end. Simon and his men entered the fort singing um, hymns of praise and thanksgiving while carrying palm branches. For those of you on your history of the Maccabees, Simon the Maccabee just drove the Syrian forces out of Jerusalem. He had liberated Israel uh, from an occupying army. And so at this point, the, the raising of palm branches, a sign of celebration um, of what is happening. And second 
Kings 9.10 is a similar situation with the garments being spread before the King Jehu. Ooh, would you read that for us, Greg? Then hurriedly they took all their cloaks and spread them for him on the bare steps, and they blew the trumpet and proclaimed Jehu as king. Oh. He would have been about, what, six? Six at the time. Eight or six. So we have the cloaks, clothes being spread. Thank you for that reference there, Greg. We've got the clothes being spread. We've got the palm branches. And then we have the crowds yelling, Hosanna, which translated would mean give salvation anew. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. I find it interesting that in five days, four days, what are they going to be yelling then? Crucify him. Crucify him. That's where I come. I made that comment earlier, and Roger was, was making it with me here, was this idea that these people are so excited about what's happening. They are looking forward to being freed from the oppression of Rome. They're looking forward to the, the potential of a savior. But what I find is that in John 12, 16, the disciples are found clueless. They're really not aware of what this all means. If those who are closest to Jesus are not fully aware of what uh, this means, then I have to assume the same for that Jesus is coming in a spiritual kingdom. And so maybe it's something that they couldn't quite grasp or understand. Like, you know, someone's telling you they're going to be crucified and, and raised to life on the third day and things. I mean, you're probably thinking, oh, okay. But maybe they just didn't understand exactly what he was trying to say. Yeah. Maybe Plus, so. you know, you're with somebody and you love them. You've been with them for three years and stuff. You know, you don't necessarily want to see them leave either. Well, and they've, I think the people have had such a, such an idea of what the Messiah would be, that anything different than that just didn't quite register for them. The crowd, they're rushing out of Jerusalem, they're rushing into Jerusalem, and they are coming because Jesus has come. John 12, verse 18, gives us a little clue as to why the, the crowd is there. Their comment is, is that the crowd is coming because they saw the signs. So what's the crowd looking for? Miracles. They're looking for more miracles. It's kind of like the people who got a whole bunch of food from loaves and fishes showed back up and they said, look, we want more. This whole entrance into Jerusalem, mind you, is coming at a great cost. And I don't want to step on anyone else's lessons, but you know, Jesus will cry over Jerusalem. There's, there's an intense sorrow going into this story for Jesus' sake. The Pharisees are the last really on the scene, per se. They come on, and as they enter, they tell Jesus that he needs to rebuke his disciples because they are, they're, they're causing a little bit of an uproar. That's in Luke 1939. There's another. This is at the wrong point, but in Luke 19, there's an echo of Luke 2. Can you lead, me, lead us further a little bit, Greg? Okay, in, in Luke 1938, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. And then Luke 2, because he comes as a child, as a child of peace. Is that where you're 
well, that's the that's part of the in Luke two. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I don't know what here good. Verse fourteen, maybe somewhere. Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom He favors. So you're saying Luke is opening with that idea, and here we're seeing a fulfillment of that idea. Yeah, the echo, the echo is there of the of what the angels say. It's being said here. <clears throat> You know, we, that's a beautiful thought. Thank you, Greg. We, uh, I'm going to jump back to the Pharisees for just a brief moment. Um, as we think about the Pharisees, Jesus makes this comment in Luke 19. He says, if, if my disciples don't cry out, the stones will cry out. What does that mean? That's awful weird. God created everything, so and He created everything to worship Him. So, if we don't cry out, then the stones in nature will. It's weird for us to think of creation of of um, of, of of inanimate <laughs> taking on a personality or having a place. It's weird for us to think that way, <clears throat> but I think it's only weird because we don't see that physically happen. But if the disciples stop crying, well, I'm I'm going to take these things that God's going to find the praise due to him, even if it comes from something that normally wouldn't talk. This is this is the culmination of why Christ came. God's will is going to be done. That sacrificial lamb is going to die on the cross. So we, we see that God's will will be done, even if we don't seem to understand the way that it's coming about. It will come about. One, one, of, one of my things. Uh, I get it. I believe it's in Romans 6. I could be off my chat a little bit. But it's uh, all he uses to pray that, that even the creator is in the pain of childbirth, waiting for the coming of the uh, sons of man. And it carries this idea that we, we look at salvation as at Jesus' work as humans, which is because we are the pinnacle of creation. But the sin that entered in the world through Adam caused all things to fall. Everything then became part of the of the world. And so what Paul is taking in Romans is to say when the blood of Christ is shed, it came first for humanity. We are the select, the, the, the highest among the created order. I'm even higher than the angels, what the Hebrews would say. But the work of Christ place even on what we would call the inanimate object of the rocks. So if the people stop crying out, Jesus is saying these rocks would find a way to cry. Because even they know who I am. I bring this up uh, because I look back to the donkey for a moment and I say we have, we have Jesus is king over the animal kingdom as he's riding on a donkey that has not been broken. He's sure. Even the dirt that we walk on, he is the king. <laughs> back to reference to uh, you know, back when Cain killed Abel, he, our God said, "The dirt, your, your brother's blood cries out." Do you have a comment? You have to get into the call. Steve, do you have a comment there? Yeah, maybe not. Sequence of events that's going on here. You've got AD, BC, this time, this time, this time, this time, this time, and no wonder they could have had this happen. This is this happening to last for some time. And you see, even today, it's still coming to last. Think 
may be fairly fed probably and more grasp of what was actually going on why they feared the most people were seeing the deeds being taken care of that they wanted to see the church time is moving If you were online and couldn't hear, uh, Chris Bergen was mentioning that this is this is a, a pivotal moment. It seems that we have all of all of time, even references to this moment in our in our history, that Jesus entering the entering into Jerusalem is bringing about one of the greatest moments for us um, that we could think of. Thank you, Chris. I think um, as we wrap up, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you two things that I think are applications, things that we could take with us. Um, sorry, I'm not going to get into Zechariah 9, verse 9. Just go ahead and know that that's a reference there. Um, Zechariah 9 and 9. Uh, really, it's 9 through 11. Um, it just highlights, again, coming in on a donkey, bringing a a nation of peace, a kingdom of peace. The, the two applications that I would want to leave you with is, is first is the lordship of Jesus. The crucifixion was not an accident that Jesus was unaware of while visiting Jerusalem. This was a very planned and intentional moment in Jesus' life, coming back to what Chris was saying. And Jesus, I think, was embracing the calling to undergo this excruciating death. I think he was doing that uh, full well aware of what the end result would be. We see that he displayed foreknowledge in almost every event. The finding of the donkey, uh, the, uh, the display of the Lord's Supper, uh, Judas's betrayal, Peter's denial, the disciples' desertion, Jesus knew all of these things beforehand. And it wasn't a problem for him to still go to the cross to save our lives. What that leads me is that if Jesus is my Lord, he's Lord of my life, he knows the details. He knows the things, and he's not ignorant. He's not ignorant of the things that I suffer with, nor of the things that I'm blessed with. He knows the numbers of the hair of my head, and that means he does not lack concern for who I am, nor who you are. I think as I see the triumphant entry, I realize that he is the king. I have to place him as the king in my life. So when you feel that Jesus doesn't know the future, can't predict what's happening, or might not fully be aware of what's going on in your life, I want you to look at the triumphant entry as a moment where if he is your king, he knows. The next thing that I would want for us to think as application is that Jesus doesn't always meet our expectations, the things that we would want. The Jews were expecting a king, a great military leader like David, who would throw Rome out and would reinstate the nation of Israel. When we read through some of the Old Testament prophecies, I think we can understand why they had this expectation, why they uh, were looking forward to what Jesus or what the Messiah was supposed to do. He rode into Jerusalem, not on a horse, fancy steed ready to, to show his victory, but more so on a donkey, humble as could be. This is also symbolic, back to David. the humility that we see in the great king. In our Christian lives, I think there are times that we encounter moments where God does not fulfill the expectation that we set. There are times that we ask for a partner in life. There are times that we ask for healing of a sickness. There are times we ask for a job to make us 
a little better line. There are times that we ask for tragedy not to strike. And I think in those moments when Jesus does not fulfill what we expect or what we hope, it becomes very difficult for us. We enter into a place of questioning, to a place of turmoil. What my comment or my hope is, is that we can look to Jesus and know that in the moments that he doesn't answer our expectations, it doesn't mean he didn't answer. When God doesn't live up to our expectations, don't jettison God out of your life. Matter of fact, maybe in those moments are the times to cling closer to him and answer or to find the answer of, God, what do you have in store for this moment that I'm not seeing? We think about the trials of today. And in the Passion Week, Jesus is thinking about the trials of eternity. That's my part of the lesson. I don't know if there's anyone that has a closing comment. I'll let you make it though. I was just gonna say like on the expectations, if, if we have expectations that God should answer all of our prayers according to our want, wants and needs or what's best for us, then we need to take a step back and look at the fact that we're in the wrong because Jesus never said we were gonna have an easy life. Uh, he didn't have an easy life. Uh, look at Paul and, and the others. They had hardships and troubles and trials. So we should, on some degree, expect the same because God didn't say, if you choose me, you're going to have a happy life because we all know that things are going to ebb and flow in our lives. You know, you're going to have life, you're going to have death, you're going to have sickness, you're going to have health, you know, health, and you're going to have different aspects all throughout your walk. But if you're looking at Jesus and God and saying, why aren't you answering my prayer? And then I'm going to get upset with you. Then we need to step back because we are wrong in our thinking. He did promise to be with us during those trials, during those hard times, during those times where our faith could be shaken. Uh, and he's there for us to turn to. And, and there is comfort in that. And there, there is no reason that we can't petition him uh look at jesus even ask god man if if there's any way you can take this cup from me please do it i mean there there's no reason when things aren't going like we hope they would there's we can still petition him to change things he may not do it but we have to understand he'll be there with us either way I want to thank you for joining us today for all those who jumped online um, either on Zoom or on YouTube this morning. Um, we're going to be transitioning over for our worship service now.